Kia ora tato. Uh, welcome everyone to this first of a series of um, chairs conversations that the transportation group is um, holding over the next few months, probably the next year or two. Um, thanks for joining us on a Friday morning and welcome to Hamilton. Um, this morning we are going to be talking with Professor Karen Witten, well I am, and I'll introduce her more formally in a moment, but uh, first just wanted to um, welcome you all and say that um, this session is going to be recorded. We'll record all of them and keep them somewhere handy on our website so that we can refer back um, and you can share them with your colleagues and friends. Um, the purpose of this series is to talk about why perhaps we don't get um, better outcomes from transport decisions, particularly why we don't see more rapid progress on our visions that we um, say, the things that we want from transport at a national and local level. How come some of the designs and the outcomes that we see going into new streets and places don't really reflect what some of us would think is the best possible practice? Why doesn't that happen more often and, and therefore um, what can we do about it to um, accelerate change for the better in our sector? So. Um, if any of you have recommendations for other people that you'd like to see me talk with um, in this series, please feel free to let me know either in the Q&A in this um, chat or by emailing me. Um, and yeah, keep an eye out for the next um, sessions that we're going to have over the coming months. We're going to try and host them at different times of the day and week so that people, more people can um, have a chance to sign in. Um, yeah, as I said, there is a Q&A box in the chat. Hopefully you can all see that and feel free to type your questions and commentary in there and we will have um, some time during this hour for a discussion of some of those questions, hopefully. So for now, yeah, welcome and thanks for joining us. And I'd like to welcome Karen, if you'd like to um, enable your camera, Karen. Maybe you have already and it will show you when you talk, but um, Professor Karen Witten, is Professor of um, Public Health, University of Auckland and Karen and I have worked together over the last few years on the Health Research Council project Inclusive Streets and Karen's worked on a number of transport projects looking at the intersection of transport and health um, and inclusion and equity and a bunch of other things as well. So uh, welcome Karen, it's really great to have you here to be able to talk with you. So. Um, my first question for you is what what interests you as a um, health academic essentially what interests you about research in transport um, kia ora bridget and thanks for having me along um yes i'm a public health researcher and our transport system undermines our health you know f um, physical activity levels are still dropping we've got high obesity rates and our social norms around car dependency are a contributing factor. And it's not only our individual health that is affected by our transport behaviours, but you know, in the face of climate change, um, the mode use we use at a population level um, is, is impacting on our collective well-being. And I mean, the questions are enormous. You know, how are we going to move from the state of entrenched a car dependency to adopt different modes and I think importantly how can we do that and bring different uh, sec sections of the community um, along with us. You know, it's so easy to say we need to increase walking and cycling and public transport use and in lots of our policy documents now across transport and health and urban development um, we have goals along those lines but how are we actually going to do it and how are we going to do it quickly and in a way that's fair um, and socially just? You know, they're, they're, they're hard questions, they're complex questions. Yeah, and they're important questions. Karen, could you just enable your camera again, please, just oh. while we're at it? Um, yes, and that's exactly why we're here. We have um, a lot of overlap in our policy areas, transport and health, Increasingly, as you mentioned, equity um, in areas like social development, a lot of these problems um, kind of circle around the transport question. And as you kind of alluded, it's not just that we want more walking and cycling, but less driving, because not only does that stop people from moving actively, but it, it is a sedentary activity, right? So in itself, it's, it's not a healthy thing. Um, 
So in that regard, what transport attributes do you think um, a healthy New Zealand community might have? Is it simply um, you know, replicating something that we might see in the Netherlands or in a good example overseas, or is there something else about New Zealand that you think would make um, for a healthy community in terms of transport? Well, I think a healthy community um, has to, all those options that are healthy ways of moving, um, walking and cycling and public transport, I mean, they have to be easy and they have to be safe. And that will be different in different contexts. But I think they also have to be um, prioritised um, within, within our, um, you know, our funding allocation system. But I mean, we also know that the flip side of transport is land use. And so, you know, if people are going to be able to walk and cycle and get to places by healthy modes, the, those daily destinations have to be within um, a reasonable distance, you know, parks and shops and playgrounds. And that's where this concept of the 15 or 20 minute neighbourhood is quite useful. So when, when planning communities, is it possible for people to reach those daily destinations within that, um, that within that reasonable period of time. And I think it's quite tricky because, you know, we're a new world country and our cities are new world cities. And so, so much of it was, um, you know, our suburban areas are low density. And so it means retrofitting some of our neighbourhoods and that's huge and, and it's costly. But, I mean, it is what we're beginning with this intensification process. Yeah, and that retrofit, like you say, it has to be from different sectors. It's not like the transport sector or the health sector can dictate mm. where a early childhood education centre goes or a dentist or a dairy. Um, so do you think perhaps um, that's part of the challenge that a lot of these, we all just work in the area that's within our control and the complex problems beyond that are too much for us? Or, you know, is there, is there a way that we could um, start to tackle that or a good example that you've seen? Yeah, I think it is. I think that's really difficult. It's that integration of planning, um, and you know, one of the, um, the one of our current projects is trying to understand what what is the bus what is business as usual around um, integration of housing and and transport planning, because that's often a good way of of picking out or or sort of unpicking, um, you know, what are those barriers around that the um, the sort of the system barriers that stop that integration. Yeah, that's really interesting. So you've got um, some projects that you're still working on in this area, but one that you've worked on in, over the last, uh, probably started about five or more years ago, I guess, Te Aramua Future Streets. Um, that project was all about um, future streets, so how, how future healthy streets should be and, and, and to have good health, out health outcomes. And it was focused in Mangani, which is a community which is ripe for um, investment and, and has a lot of people who would benefit from um, healthy choices, transport choices. Can you tell us in a nutshell, for people who aren't aware, what, what Te Aramua Future Streets project was about? I'm sure. Yeah, it's, um, it's a streetscape intervention, but it's also a research project, as you said, in Māngari, in Tamaki Makaurau. Um, and uh, what's distinctive about it is that it's a, it's a neighbourhood scale intervention. And so it was designed to, um, to slow traffic, um, um, make it easier for walking and cycling, and to tra change driver behaviour. But importantly, it was um, it, the design was developed through a participatory design process that involved local residents, mana whenua, the research team, the local board, as well as transport um, professionals. Um, and I mean, at the time, um, th that was seen as quite a disruptive way to approach a local um, neighbourhood development, because it sort of was contrary to I think perhaps a more um, linear transport planning approach, which might be to um, consult, design, procure, deliver um, to, a, to a budget. Whereas we wanted to have a more iterative process that we went into the community and asked what were the, what were the problems? Um, what are your safety hotspots? Uh, what are your aspirations for change here? And we, we went back a number of times with um, as we sort of tried to figure out what were going to be possible options for change. Um, but ultimately, um, you know, I think that participatory process 
Uh, everybody recognised that it led to better design solutions. But as well as being an inter a street intervention that involved traffic calming and more pedestrian crossings and um, a uh, sort of a much more pleasant pedestrian environment, it's, it's also a research project. It's a controlled intervention study. Um, so it's a longitudinal study. We have a control group and over time and over a number of waves of data collection, we're uh, measuring uh, safety outcomes, um, health outcomes, mode shift, physical activity, uh, environmental outcomes, air quality, as well as traffic outcomes, you know, speed and volume type um, outcomes. So what have been some of the highlights then from, from that measurement or, um, you know, the best outcomes or things that, you know, have delighted you about that project? <laughs> well, um, I, I, I guess some of the early findings that have been really pleasing have been that uh, traffic speeds and volumes in the streets that have uh, had interventions in the intervention area have, uh, have dropped compared to the control area. Um, accident rates have dropped in the intervention area compared to the control area and compared to uh, across um, Auckland more widely. Um, accessibility, I mean, as, as you know, because you did the accessibility audit on the plans for us, that was, a, that was an important aspect of the design. Um, and so it's been really um, gratifying to find that in our video, street video monitoring and in our survey findings that people using mobility aids there are more people using aids who are out and about on the streets than there were um, beforehand. In some other areas, it's still um, early days. Um, we're eagerly waiting the results of our um, data collection this year, um, especially around mode use and physical activity. Uh, we were supposed to have a wave of data collection last year, but with COVID, um, that was delayed until this year. So we're eagerly awaiting those findings. Um, other outcomes, I think, um, through focus groups with local residents, we've we've learned that the 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 soft infrastructure changes, you know, the aesthetic improvements, the um, the placemaking, um, the changes to the greenway routes, as well as the on street environment with the landscaping and the public art, and um, those things have been they have really contributed to. Um, sort of pride, local pride in the area. And so I think we've really learned that those soft infrastructure are as important as the hard infrastructure if you're wanting to have the change. Because the change is, is a social change as well as an actual change in, in, in mode. Well, um, that's um, really interesting, isn't it? About we want to encourage walking and cycling. Those activities aren't solely undertaken for transport reasons people do them because it's enjoyable and pleasant and so for it to be pleasant then it needs to be more than engineered in a hard sense and we need to create environments so that makes me think that as transport pr practitioners we need to work more with the landscape architects and urban designers mm -hmm. and place making people and you know um, biologists or people who know which plants are, are best yeah. in a different area um, if we want to create those experiences and it, it kind of reminds me of um, you know how we look at transport from an engineering perspective as being about network and optimizing a network but when it comes to health it's much more about place and experience if we want to attract people to that so perhaps that's one of the disconnects that, that we need to break down is, is working more on place. I think so and I think that was one of the um, outcomes of engaging with mana whenua and um, being informed by the tiaranga principles because that really did bring in the notions of cultural landscaping and it really you know it, it, it heightened the role that those placemaking activities played in the local area and you know the and bringing in and I think it also um, it brought in um, you know, local artists to the process and Auckland Transport, I mean Auckland Council rather, then um, came in with additional funding to um, to provide some um, funding for carvings that and it all added to that sense of um, pride and presence in place. And, and you know, just feeling good about being in the neighbourhood and being out and about. <laughs> 
Yeah, that's so interesting, and I hadn't thought about this, but um, I live in Hamilton, and, and I had my bike upgraded to an e-bike earlier this year, and now I'm much more likely to bike along River Road in Hamilton, which is really hilly compared to the more flat, direct route that I used to take, partly because it's wider and I feel safer from traffic, but actually being near the river makes me really proud because it's so nice in Hamilton, and we don't really celebrate it enough, but there's something about having that daily connection to nature um, by actually seeing the river flowing past you um, that is totally disconnected from transport planning <laughs> but it's crucial mm. to why I want to bike so mm. and, and to bike that way so yeah I think it's an interesting um, you know cross-sector collaboration generally but particularly in terms of place making and linking with mana whenua you know even the phrase mana whenua it's about the land and the people in the land isn't it and um, really remembering that in our practice would um, serve us well. I think there is an increasing understanding and willingness um, to engage with mana whenua. The Innovating Streets projects have promoted that as well, um, but that's, that's great that it was a strong theme within Te Aramua. Um, do you think you've well, talked about... Sorry, go on. I was just going to say your comment about um, being close to nature as you're walking as you're biking along the river. I mean, that's very consistent with a finding of work by um, Kirsty Wilde and Alistair Woodward with, yep. with um, a trial of e-bikes and that close to nature through biking was one of their findings. Well, and the thing with an e-bike, there's not going to be <laughs> hijacked with an e-bike enthusiasm thread, but um, you can choose to go a bit out of your way and not expend too much energy doing so with an e-bike. That's the advantage, and it doesn't matter if it's hilly or slightly further. You can find yourself drawn to the places where you want to, to go because they're nice, and it's kind of, you know, almost as simple as that. Um, However, I know in Future Streets, you talk, um, and Hamish Mackey, who is one of the lead researcher, talks a lot about socio-technical challenges. And I know it wasn't all smooth sailing, and um, that's why we're here, because transport is never um, straightforward. There are a lot of constraints. So um, what do you think were some of those challenges that you learned about the most in that project, or that you had insights to that you perhaps hadn't been cognizant of before? Hmm. Well, I think um, there were challenges. I mean, and we were trying to do uh, an, an intervention that wasn't business as usual. Mm. So it was um, it was against the grain. You know, we were trying to do a neighbourhood scale intervention, and I don't know. You'll know better than I. But it seemed that um, most of the um, projects that were on the go at Auckland Transport tended to be more a street or a, or a device. Whereas this neighbourhood scale intervention was um, was quite different, um, and I think you know our starting point, um, you know, was as as I said, we wanted to um, you know meet and try to define what the local issues were, um, and that that wasn't um, you know that wasn't consistent with a you know design procure deliver um, approach. It was slow, uh, it was iterative. Um, and we were seen as um, raising expectations that um, perhaps weren't going to be met. Um, so that was that, that was difficult. But I think perhaps one of the um, biggest challenges was we landed on 88 Auckland Transport, and from their perspective, we weren't a project. You know, where had we come from? We weren't part of the. Um, um, RLTP, we weren't part of the NLTP, we weren't a line item on any of these schedules, we didn't have a budget anywhere. What what could they do with us? You know, we were we were we were sort of problematic. Um, we, we we had we had got funding from MB for a research project based on a promissory note really from Auckland Transport that they would um, they would design and deliver uh, this this program. Um, but when it came down to it, we realised that there really was no mechanism available for trying to um, integrate a programme that um, came from the outside of the system into the system. So I guess from a socio-technical systems model, if you sort of think about Gail's model, we were a niche project that was coming in from the outside, um, trying to sort of prod the regime, but the regime said, well, we've got no way for you to get in. We've got no way for you to, to, to prod us. So, um, you know, I think that, that was a really 
really big challenge. But I think also once we um, became, you know, they accepted we were part, we were there, and we 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 were part of a project. Um, the other other issues that we confronted were, I think that, that there's a sort of a, a conservatism um, within transport, and here we were trying to do something that was innovative, um, and and the, the, the sort of the, the whole system is set up to um, avoid risk, and often for very good reasons around um, safety. But we also realised that there was also, uh, you know, that, that the conservatism also arose out of the very ways, the very way of working that for, you know, engineers, standards and manuals are their tools of trade and largely, you know, shape their professional practice. And one of the um, benefits of that is that from a personal practitioner's point of view, if something goes wrong, you've got some legal protection. So here, here we were asking um, the, the transport professionals to do things that were slightly different, that deviated from their codes of practice. And so that felt professionally risky. And also from an um, organisational point of view, there was the potential of um, legal and reputational risk. So these were things that we really had to um, negotiate carefully. And I think there's also that, um, uh, that desire for consistency and predictability and calcul calculability, which are implicit within um, transport um, standards. They, they, they tend to um, lock in relationships and ways of working with sets of rules and planning models that do make it difficult to, um, to, to bring about change. I mean, they, they, you know, they're designed to keep things consistent for lots of very good reasons. But because of that, change becomes more difficult. And we, we, we struggled with that. We, we, you know, we bounced against that on quite a number of occasions. So perhaps that's something that needs to be made more clear to people creating visions for something new. So Auckland, for example, has um, you know climate emergency visions and goals and um, vision zero road safety goals. And as you've said, it's easy to say these kinds of things, but perhaps the, the um, politicians and leaders making these declarations um, either aren't fully aware of the strength of that regime that, that we're trying to prod, mm -hmm. or um, perhaps naive as to how difficult it is to you know, move the ship. It's a really big ship. And while everybody is trying to do their best in, in delivering as well as they can within that, um, we're talking about quite drastic change that, that we'd like. Um, so how, I wonder, can we unpack some of that, um, you know, to, to translate that vision into practice a bit better. Do you think there's any examples of learnings from future streets? Do you think it's about those codes and designs that need to be improved? Is it um, centred on that participatory process that you talked about? Or is there something else um, that you think of that could really be a powerful lever to help um, councils and well, Auckland Transport? Yeah, I mean, I think at the end of Future Streets, um, partly out of our frustration, but also I think um, many of the transport professionals we also worked with experienced that same frustration. We, we organised a workshop called Making Trials Easier. And I think there was a general agreement at that, that within um, all these transport um, plans, um, there, needs to be, there needs to be room for innovation, there needs to be room for trials. So there needs to be a, you know, a funding line item which enables these things to happen so that we don't have to um, be in a queue that's four years long in order to um, trial something. Um, and I think you know, the Innovation Streets for People projects have been a really good example. And I think it partially came out of that um, workshop and that call for change. But um, just to go back to your other question about um, participatory processes, I, you know, I definitely think um, you know, keeping close to the ground in terms of close to the needs of people in communities can be a really powerful way of, of getting change. Because I certainly think with, with us as a, um, as a Future Streets 
collective, including both researchers and residents and the transport professionals, what, uh, what, what really galvanised us as a, as a team was spending time in Māngari, engaging with local people, finding out what those issues were, and really sort of, <laughs> I mean, it sounds so sort of um, twee in a way, but actually realising that the kaupapa of this project was to make daily life better for the people that leave, lived in those streets. I mean, it's sort of so obvious on one level, but it wasn't. And it was really when we all sort of, you know, realised that and we gelled on that, that things started to flow. And our um, sort of professional or, or ways of differences in our ways of working sort of melted into the background. Um, and we sort of came together. So I do think that um, keeping close to the needs of people is fairly important. That's really great. It reminds me of um, some work I did last year on equity in, in Auckland's transport system and talking, I talked with um, someone from the Salvation Army um, and halfway through our conversation I just had this rising feeling of embarrassment that I'd never talked to anyone from the Salvation Army and I doubt many transport engineers have either but the needs that people have are so urgent and compelling and um, I agree with you that if we step away from our open plan flexi time offices and we were in the mire of RLTPs and ongoing kinds of work, remind ourselves in this tangible way by spending time with people in the communities that we're supposed to be serving, um, what are their needs? Like, as you say, staying close to the needs of, of people in communities might help to shift some of our mechanisms closer to the visions that we want to deliver. We want healthy and safe and equitable, inclusive places. Um, we say those things and then we go back to what we know and, and what is covered by our risk management plans and what our lawyers are probably happy with, which is, um, you know, continued kind of car centric um, intersection by intersection planning. Um, and perhaps, as you say, one way to do that would be to not assign all of the budget to the things that we've done before, but to leave some flexibility in that to respond to the needs of communities insofar as they align with what we say our vision is. Um, so more flexibility in annual, you know, funding rounds might be one really practical way to do that. And I know that Innovating Streets projects have had their challenges, certainly in Hamilton, um, but we've absolutely learned from them. We're learning from every project in terms of um, how to do some of these things better. So as well as more interaction with community, how do you see the role of interaction between researchers and practitioners? Do you think that's that's quite, quite healthy in transport? Do you think um, there are ways that it could be improved? Um, well, yes, I think interaction is, is incredibly important. Um, I mean, and it can happen through all of the usual means, like, you know, conferences, you know, shared beer on a Friday. But I think something like, um, you know, a demonstration project like Future Streets um, is, is incredibly valuable because it's sustained interaction over time. So you've got to both talk and listen and experience the problems as they arise and problem solve as they arise. And it's only through that sustained engagement that I think you start to realize just um, how different our worldviews can be. I mean, just, just an example, as researchers, we're really evidence-based. I mean, it's what we train to do, to trial and evaluate and create evidence. Whereas I think we, over time we realize that, that as transport engineers, perhaps um, you were more, um, in, more, more influenced by precedent. You know, what's been done before? What's worked well elsewhere? And so, you know, we had to sort of accommodate those differences as we, as we, um, you know, as we went along. Um, but I do, I mean, I think, you know, your experience with the Salvation Army, I mean, we had a similar experience um, in terms of the, those blind spots. I mean, we had walked around the Tiaramu of Future Streets area a number of times, and we had never once recognised that somebody 
um, in a wheelchair could not get through a walkway. And it was only when I was doing a walking interview with somebody in a wheelchair, I thought, wow, they can't even get through here. You know, I think we're just blind um, to what isn't part of our own experience. So we've got to keep on being drawn back into that, um, you know, that um, those interactions with each other as, as professional groups, but also interactions with um, people on the ground. Yeah, that's that's really um, good reminder that unless the sector and the profession is representative of society, then we need to go and interact with a more representative um, cross-section of society. But I think there's also a role for measures um, and monitoring of outcomes to see whether we're meeting those goals to try and catch some of those blind spots. Like you said, you know that um, counting mobility aids is a favourite kind of measure of mine. It's just an indicator of who's there and who's not there. Um, mm -hmm. So do you think there was something in, um, something in research that helps promote that evidence base beyond um, precedent-based planning, doing what was done before? But research, I think, is particularly scientific um, research, but qualitative storytelling as well, can help to bring some of this evidence to light, which we might be missing if we're just um, you know, delivering the same old. Do you think there are um, measures and, and methods that we should bring in from research into, into practice as part of our um, planning and monitoring cycles? Yeah, well, I think um, you, know, you, do, you do actually measure a lot, but perhaps it's that um, the, you know, the analysis of that and the constantly bringing forward of it and thinking about what the implications of the, um, those measures are and you know, come, bringing those measures into conversations with the future planning. Mm. Yeah, I agree. Um, so we talked about researchers and practitioners working together, but going back to the health sector as a whole, like I was talking to someone at the Two Walk and Cycle conference and she said part of her role at the Ministry of Health is to look at active transport but she's the only person in the Ministry of Health who has uh, any transport focus and it's only part of her role. So do you think mm -hmm. there's a case for more cross-ministry, cross-department, you know, in Wellington and elsewhere collaboration so that all of their visions can be more effectively informed and realised as well? Oh, ab absolutely, because I think, you know, it, We've got such um, established ways of working and thinking that we are very, very siloed. Mm. And you know, I'm always amazed when you go to a health conference that there's often no nobody there or no presentations about housing, or at um, housing yeah. conferences about transport, yeah. or at transport conferences about about health. You know, we don't encourage this integration of our knowledges. Um, I mean, I, I think it was great at the, at the decarbonising transport conference earlier this year, actually, that there were a couple of the international presentations that did bring in um, planning, urban form and transport, a couple of the international um, people. Um, I think not, there weren't so many local presentations, but I think now as Chair Bridget, um, next year you could have a lot more health and housing um, contributions to your transport conference as a way of trying to integrate those different knowledge bases. You know, but one thing we, we certainly learned from Tiara Moore is that business as usual is a very powerful force and, it, you know, health will have to have a persistent and um, strong voice if it's going to um, help to trigger change and a realisation that um, health is a critical outcome of the transport sector. And, it, and it, I mean, it could be that, um, you know, because I think transport has probably never had to measure the sort of negative externalities on health of its practice. And those are the sorts of measures that if they were, you know, regularly in front of us all, might make a difference. Well, that's right. And we talked at the start about the health cost of sitting in a car and I often wonder about if we included that in our benefit cost calculations actually if we're growing car traffic there's a health disbenefit independent of all of the other um, costs and benefits because of that the fact the mere fact of sitting down for all of that time and encouraging people to do that is not a good thing for our waistlines so um, but the health um, 
question brings me to my final kind of question for you, and it's my favourite one because I just made it up this morning. Um, in light of the times that we find ourselves in and, and the COVID pandemic and um, my sister in the UK getting very confused and worried about what's happening to the world, um, if we had an Ashley Bloomfield of transport, if you were the Director General of transport and you got to stand up with the Prime Minister every afternoon at a briefing to say how many deaths we've had from the transport system you know, that day and how many new cars there were out on the road infectious in the community and what your recommendation to Parliament was to do about that. Um, you know, this is putting you on the spot, obviously, but um, Ashley Bloomfield has become a really strong voice for science, you know, and for evidence-based decision makings, and we're all pretty much doing what he advises. So if that were you in transport, given that we are killing people every day um, in our transport system, directly and indirectly, um, you know, is that, is that a good metaphor? What do you think we could do about it? Do we have a lockdown and, and, and refuse to let people use this system until we get it under control? Or um, is there some other advice that you might give in your new role as Director General of Transport? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, we definitely we, we need somehow to get that urgency um, understood. It's a, it's a cultural, it's a social cultural change that we need to, to, to really instill in people that there is that urgency. And yeah, we have done it before. I mean, the, the, the pandemic has been a really good example. But um, do you remember when we used to have um, every night on the news, there'd be the, the burn time for... Um, yeah, the, sunburn, the, yeah. You know, sunburn. And I mean, that really made a change to people's use of hats and sun cream, you know. So I do think that regular use of the of the news um, is really important. And I, mean, I think graphics are really important. I mean, I think with the sunburn, did we used to have the, the daily numbers of minutes or, or something yeah. that was burn yeah. time? You know, we need a really good and regular graphic that we can use um, so people can see, yes, this is the impacts of, of what we're doing on a, on a, on a daily basis. I mean, yeah, we, that's we've, really, we've, yeah. yeah, I mean, we've, we've been working a lot with um, Toby Morris recently and he was very involved also with um, the pandemic and creating graphics that you know bring the science to the community and i think we have to get better and not only producing reports and publications but using different forms of um, uh, dissemination that are going to reach different people within um, the community and graphics is a really good way to go yeah, so working with communications specialists and artists, as the Ministry of Health has done with, with the COVID situation mm. to get the message across to the broadest range of the community. That's that's really great. I've got um, lots of notes here that I'll kind of summarise and send out with the recording of this, but we've got time for a bit of um, discussion now. So I'll just go through some of these questions in the order that they were entered. So um, you may have sort of covered this already, but in the face of climate change, um, and our, you know, needs to respond to those challenges. How do you think the Te Aramua model, um, researcher practitioner demonstration project, will help us to transition our transport system quickly with urgency that this issue deserves? Do you think it um, goes back to having that flexible funding allocation? Do you think it's um, it's a model for community engagement, or um, are you not that optimistic? <laughs> or um, yeah, what is it about it that you think could help us in the climate change um, kind of era? Um, well, I think we have to be guided um, by also what's happened elsewhere. And I think, you know, in, in the UK, they've been um, developing these neighbourhood, low traffic neighbourhoods for quite a while, and they're starting to see the change in um, mode shift, you know, transport behaviours. Mm. Um, and I, I know I, I was really um, pleased to see the Waka Kotahi initiative of a community of practice around low traffic neighbourhoods and trying to get people together to learn about what had been done elsewhere. And I think that's a really good way of trying to bring um, researchers and practitioners um, and potentially community. I mean, I think, I think bringing in your, um, you know, your local government um, people, your local boards in the Auckland context into these conversations is, is really important because actually for us with Te Aramua, the strongest advocates for what we've been doing there has been the local board. You know, they contributed funding, they can see the potential of it. 
um, yeah. <laughs> Well, that's interesting because we don't have local boards outside of Auckland, or perhaps, or well, at least not in Hamilton. I don't, I don't know whether there are any other examples um, in New Zealand, but um, perhaps that layer of connection between people and the higher up kind of decision makers and council is, is really could be really powerful, particularly if they had the purse strings for flexible funding options that could be used to devote to some of these trials and mm. include some from somewhere, some kind of research um, or even monitoring budget to, to test, because I think perhaps in transport we don't test enough whether those projects delivered on the outcomes we said we wanted. We do measure, as you say, a lot of things as, you know, mm. as routine, traffic volumes and speeds and things, but we don't, um, we find it hard to isolate the effect of our investment on the outcome that we wanted. And partly that's because mm. transport's complex and humans are complex, but, um, yeah, more flexible funding and including more funding for monitoring, perhaps. Yeah, and it takes a long time. Mm. You know, like, I mean, you, you, I think you said we've been involved for five or something years. Well, actually, it's up to nine years <laughs> now with Tia yeah. um, Moore. And we're oh, getting we, older, we, Karen. <laughs> no, we're doing a wave of data collection this year, and we will again in two years' time. And I think that, you know, that's the problem. It does take time um, for initiatives like this, for the for the outcomes to be um, revealed. You know, because people's um, travel behaviours are very habitual, and it takes you know a while for a built environment um, change to actually feed through to to changes in in mode shift, etc. So, yeah. yeah, I think it's really important to measure, um, but we can't. We, we can't wait for those measurements. We've also start, got to start moving and um, you know trying different different options out. Yeah, so maybe in that regard, there's a case to um, using evidence for general interventions that we know that we know are, have a strong likelihood of getting the outcomes we want. So mm -hmm. there's a question mm -hmm. here about can you point us in the right direction to um, regional or local evidence about health and obesity and car use and, and how these things interact. Perhaps there's a case for the transport group hosting um, information portal about how to find this stuff because I know I've talked with at conferences about even finding age structure from the Statistics New Zealand website is not straightforward. It's not something that um, is intuitive but it can be really powerful if you're arguing for um, planning that's child centric or or that helps older people. So um, do you think that's something we could do is to is to be um, conduits for information for each other? Sure, sure. And I think, um, and, 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 you know, just going back to the decarbonising transport conference earlier in the year, I, th I think that was a really good example where you did bring um, speakers in who had that knowledge and experience and the data from elsewhere. You know, I know, you know, we, we are unique here and we can't just take interventions from elsewhere and um, impose them on our, our communities. But there's often a lot of evidence on what's likely to be effective that we can get from elsewhere that can inform what we do here. And yeah, I think researchers can be really good conduits for bringing that, um, that knowledge and information. And I mean, now's not a great time for anybody to be traveling, but I, I would like to mention that I think um, you know, a, f a few years ago, MB funded um, a group of us to to go and look at, I guess, what you'd now call, um, you know, low traffic neighbourhoods that were existing in, in Europe. And um, th the chair of the local board in Māngari Otahu who was part of that. And I think that's that's really given her the vision of what's possible. So, you know, giving people the vision of what can happen if you're just persistent and keep on um, trying and, and um, you know, prodding change. I think that can be quite an inspirational thing to do as well. Yeah. But maybe now we've got to do it all um, online, you know, but, but have really good um, exposure to um, examples elsewhere that have been really effective. Well, and even um, 
sharing some of the evidence from the New Zealand projects. We've got inclusive streets evidence. We could um, do virtual walkthroughs as researchers and show people um, the examples of challenges that people face navigating those streets that are actually local New Zealand places. And perhaps some of those examples you talked about, so the, the path where someone using a wheelchair couldn't get through, the, the crossing where you had more people with mobility aids crossing after it, that kind of thing, if we had it in a little video or you know, getting creative with communications people and artists as a snapshot to show in a council meeting in Hamilton. This is why we are advocating for this kind of crossing here or this kind of street design, because we know that it's most likely to give you the outcomes that you say you want. Um, I think perhaps starting within within um, New Zealand and within the projects that we're familiar with and working up from there to say, and this in itself was informed by overseas where we know that it happens all the time and, and can be really useful. Um, and perhaps using those, like I mean, thinking about the conference challenge, we have our decarbonising transport conference was really great and it felt really um, like crossing some of those boundaries between transport health and inequity. But we also had feedback from some in, our, in the transportation group that it, that it was um, too specific and also not transport enough. So there are people who, who in, our, in our sector, you know, we've got 1,200 members and a lot of them are doing something quite niche and they don't feel that it's their role to work across sector or to look at other things. They're kind of a cog in, in the transport specific process. And I guess that's why all sectors have their own specific conferences. They're trying to cover all of the specialties of their members, let alone looking at the bigger questions and, and linkages that don't happen now. So perhaps there's a case for, Gosh, we have so many conferences, but you know, a different one um, that crosses transport, health, um, environment, and social, you know, outcomes. Perhaps there's something something that we could do in that area. Yeah, and are there very many people across um, different um, local governments around the country who have a particular role about um, you know integrative planning, integrating transport and housing planning? I mean, how do those people come together? What feeds their practice, and how do they influence, um, you know, the, the the sectors that they are engaging with? Yeah, transport and housing. Like housing comes up all the time. And in fact, it was suggested mm. we could have a transport conference focused on housing. And immediately, I thought of the disengagement of most of our members in, in that specific topic. But it's so huge. Mm. It's so huge, and we don't come together mm. to talk about it. Um, even having, you know, talking to Kainga Order about that, about that kind of challenge. How do we um, get um, more aligned in the way that we're delivering these things, so that so that we're friends with the councils and with the developers um, to get the outcomes again that we that we say we all want. There's um, one last question or point that here um, about. One of the issues we face is people travel not just to work, of course, and we know that a lot of transport models and planning are kind of based on peak hour commuter trips, but also to school and preschool. And there's a question here about um, integration, collaboration with the Ministry of Education. And I know that often comes up in transport planning that the Ministry of Education, um, I know that they're not allowed to invest in roads, for example. They're only allowed to invest in the school site or the, the campus site that they're on. A lot of early childhood facilities, well, most of them are, are privately run and they, they pop up in different parts of the community, whether or not people can access those at all, let alone in a healthy way, um, is, not something that we talk about either. So did you, in Te Aramura or elsewhere, have you um, come up, talked with people who struggle to access early childhood or to get to school in a healthy way? And is that something where you see a disconnect? Uh, well, you know, two things. In, in Te Aramua, I mean, the the um, resistance was more the, the loss of parking outside schools and preschools. Uh -huh. So you know, it was more trying to engage with um, community to uh, convince them that actually there were alternatives that you could walk your children to school. There were um, walking school buses. There were um, there was parking a little bit further away, and that you could actually walk to the preschool from the car park. Um, but that reminds me of another study that we um, have we we did where we. Um, we, look, we identified schools around the country that had high rates of active school travel. And we went and spoke to, Greer Hawley um, went and spoke to principals 
in these various schools to try to understand what is it about this school that means you've got such high rates of active school travel compared to other places. And we found that um, in those places there tended to be a really close relationship between local community and community culture that was encouraging of active school travel, the lo local government um, and their willingness to um, provide that supportive infrastructure that would support active school travel, and school policies. Um, I think actually a school close to where you live, they also it's had my son's teachers. school actually, Karen. Yeah, <laughs> <Is it? laughs> yeah, yeah, he bikes, of course, yeah. Yeah, he, he bikes, yeah, and I think there they, they allowed um, the use of wheels and um, and skateboards, etc., during school time, and some of the uh, some of the um, recreational events they did involved biking and skateboarding. So they integrated active modes into as many aspects of schooling as they possibly could, and they took um, issues around safety around the school gate really um, really to heart. So, you know, even there, it was the coming together of different groups, local government, parents, local community, and the schools, to problem solve together. That's really nice kind of synthesis, that this is about coming together. It's about um, not being afraid to talk with other people who, who aren't within our own sector, but the people who want to make a difference, then we need to go and work with community, stay close to that community to keep in front of mind what the needs of, of people are and what the most urgent needs are of people and planet and to work with the thinkers and the decision makers in a lot of other sectors and in the community to unpack those challenges kind of one neighbourhood at a time. Perhaps perhaps that's the way to do it and then to use those examples to um, unlock funding and opportunity to do more and to do better. And, you, and absolutely essential for a good collaboration is a trusting relationship. You know, you've got to have a respectful relationship where you recognise that each, each group brings different knowledge, has different expertise, and we need to listen <laughs> as well as talk. Listen. And that takes, you know, it takes time to listen and talk and understand this, the sort of constraints that different um, people are working within. And if you can understand the constraints as well as the opportunities, then there's an opportunity to, to collectively um, troubleshoot and problem solve. That's awesome. I'm glad that you've just endorsed my listening and talking uh, method <laughs> to unpack some of these challenges. Um, it's been really wonderful talking to you this morning, Karen. I'm going to send out a summary of um, our conversation, some of the points that we raise, some of the actions that we might pursue. Um, and thank you to, to everybody who has been part of this um, conversation. You're welcome to email any more comments, comments or feedback straight to me and I'll look forward to seeing you all again in our next conversation in the series and we'll see if we can keep on doing better in our quest to do better. So thanks very much.